How are we going to stitch this together? Let's see. Welcome to the Climate Question from the, the BBC World Service. With me, Kate Lamble. And me, Neil Rizal. Today, we are talking about recycling, recycling waste, rubbish. We're making this by recycling sounds from the poll shows. Because polls show most people think recycling is the best thing you can do to help fight climate change. Wow. Neil, you're really, really, really hot. Hang on, I never said that. Did so. It's on tape. Our question this week. <laughs> Does recycling help fight climate change? Let's start with what might be a bit of nostalgia for you, Neil. Reduce, reuse, recycle. It's worth it. It is worth it. Thank you for that. That's an old Canadian public service ad. The three R slogan, reduce, reuse, recycle, goes back decades, long before people really started putting the pieces together about how human activity was driving climate change. Today, recycling is a habit for millions. And a recent global report from the independent pollsters Ipsos suggests most people believe recycling is the number one thing people in developed countries can do to reduce emissions. Curious, right? We're going to look at why people think this. But first, what are we even talking about when we talk about recycling? To begin, let's go to Malaysia in Southeast Asia, where reporter Chen Yuwen has been looking into this for us. So we are here at Tanjung Harapan, which means Cape Hope in uh, Port Klang. And I'm just standing here at this uh, public seafront. And to my right, you see the north port where there are shipping containers stacked up. And to the left is the west port. West port is a bigger shipping container storage. Why is that place so important for our story about recycling? Well, you know, Port Klang is a major shipping port in Malaysia and we have, if not tens of thousands, we're talking about maybe hundreds of thousands containers coming in through this port into the country. And some of those containers carry waste. Malaysia has become one of the key destinations for waste from around the world. So when word spread that Malaysia is fast becoming a gold mine from this mountain of uh, foreign trash, then more recyclers started to jump in. How do they make money off this rubbish? What are they paid to do? Well, from speaking to people on the ground, one facility would purchase and shred the plastics into tiny shards, and then it will be transported to another facility to be melted down into recycled pallets, and then exported to manufacturing industry, which wants cheap raw material. Making the unwanted wanted, turning the old into new, this is recycling. The word itself suggests a loop, a cycle, going round and round. You can perhaps see why people would intuitively think this helps the planet and keeps emissions down. But think of how most of the economy works. It's not a cycle at all. Ke Wang from the World Resources Institute says it's more linear, like a straight line. That means we dig up the minerals, fossil resources, we make them into products, and then when we no longer need those products, we dump them or we burn them. Right, that's a linear. It goes from one end to the other end. It doesn't come back. And that is problematic. In a lot of ways, there's local pollution, there's the effect on wildlife and so on. But we're focusing on climate change. All the energy used to create, consume and then dispose of this stuff creates emissions. Lots of them. It generates about half of global greenhouse gas emissions and it causes about 90% of biodiversity loss. So anything that bends what she calls the linear economy into a loop surely helps reduce that, right? Totally logical. You can see why all those people in that poll thought the recycling would be the most effective action to fight global warming. But it's not really necessarily the single most effective action, I have to say. And this might contradict the fact that I'm a recycling expert, but we have to put things in, in perspective. Our recycling expert is Costas Velas, an engineer and lecturer at the University of Leeds in England. Let us dispel a myth. There are no real perpetual materials. There are always loss of quality, and there are always losses as part of the process. We always need to put additional resources in the process. That loss of quality means your kid's high-quality plastic toy might become a basic plastic flower pot. 
The pot may then be recycled into plastic fibres that could go into making a bag. The quality is lower, but there's still some use there. Eventually, however, there's nothing left to do with the plastic but throw it away. It's exhausted. That's the quality question. Then there's the fact that all these stages require energy. We've been talking about Malaysia. Recycling facilities there are overwhelmingly reliant on oil, gas and coal. So the energy used to recycle creates emissions that drive climate change. Don't get us wrong, though. Recycling isn't entirely rubbish when it comes to reducing emissions. There are potential savings when we try to recycle instead of manufacturing the products from the very first place. But this is not as universal as we would have liked or would have thought. Right, so there are some products for which a new version is actually better for the climate. Yes. Take paper. Recent peer-reviewed research published in Nature Sustainability found that newly produced sheets have a lower carbon footprint than recycled paper. Greenhouse gas emissions go up when we recycle paper. In the effort to recycle, we can end up with this paradoxical, seemingly paradoxical outcome. And it comes down to energy. I'm talking to you from the west coast of Canada, where there's historically a big pulp and paper industry. And a lot of our, most of our power here comes from hydroelectric dams, which have a lower greenhouse gas impact than using a coal-fired power plant or whatnot. But because paper is recycled in places where they do burn fossil fuels, that that is one reason that can account for this kind of surprising result. Yeah, this could be a core consideration. If we are to think about the climate implications of the whole recycling paper or any other materials, these should be a core consideration of our approach. The same logic applies to aluminium cans. Here, recycling is a definite win. Making new aluminium is incredibly energy intensive. Costas says making a recycled aluminium can produces up to 95% fewer emissions. And then there are the plastics, which are made from fossil fuels. With the plastics, in most of the cases, when we try to compare like for like, we cannot just compare one kilogram, for example, of virgin plastic with one kilogram of recycled plastic, we have to take into account also the effort we have taken to produce the secondary plastic. Hmm. So a recycled aluminum can is likely to have a lower carbon footprint versus new than a recycled plastic bottle versus new. Exactly. It's worth lingering on plastics because they get so much press. And because plastics are everywhere. Their amazing variety presents a real problem when it comes to recycling. Not all plastic can be technically recycled as we speak. So you might put there a plastic film thinking you're doing the right thing, but this material might not be targeted for recycling by your local authority, or might not be technically recyclable at all, or might be not financially viable to recycle this material, which is for the vast majority of plastics. So you might have materials there that they look potentially recyclable, but in fact, they're not. How much plastic is recycled? The numbers are not really, really great. So from all the plastics waste that is generated around the world, we know that roughly only 15% is collected for recycling. And from that, only half is actually recycled. So out of 100 kilogram of plastic waste generated, only eight of them will eventually be recycled. Whoa, that's tiny. And you wouldn't believe how much time I spend washing and sorting all out. Same, and I hate doing it. But (laughs) it's important to say that if you and I didn't spend time sorting and cleaning our recycling, things would be even worse. So please keep the faith, Kate. Sticking with it. A few years ago, China was the number one destination for the world's rubbish. Then they really cracked down on the practice because so much of what they were being sent just couldn't be recycled. Malaysia has followed suit. It's now begun to limit what it will accept. But where there's money to be made, there are people willing to break the rules to get it. Our reporter Wen in Malaysia has been tracking down sites being used to illegally store waste. She was told about one where there were bales of plastic. But when she arrived... There had been a big fire because the building was in ruins 
and the road in front of the building, it was scotch black. And we tried to look for some of the plastic waste that were there, but a lot of them were melted, you know, in clumps of just black goo. Fires are common in the illegal waste business. It's a tool of the trade, in fact. If you haven't got the means to store or actually recycle the waste, you resort to less environmentally friendly techniques. So they get stuff that they can't recycle and they just think, well, what are we going to do with it? Let's burn mm. it. Yeah, mm. and that's the easiest and fastest way to dispose of this plastic waste. When recorded her visit to that site of black goo, she visited with Farhan Nasser from a group called Break Free from Plastic. So maybe Farhan, you can tell us a little bit about this place. So it's pretty clear that there was imported waste, but now after our visit, last two weeks had been burned. So it's a bit unrecognisable. This, this, uh, this is charcoal facial mm -hmm. foam. Mm -hmm. Japanese. Japanese. Well, there is more here. Also Japanese wordings. This looks like cosmetic products. You do smell something kind of like a metallic chemical smell in the air around here. Kind of like gunpowder. We see waste. They are rubber tires, burnt plastic. This is crumpled plastic Europe. from Europe. The food packaging, I think. Mm. There's some heating instructions. Uh, Sainsbury's? Sainsbury's. Ah, mm -hmm. it's a cheese and onion roll from Sainsbury. So Sainsbury's is a supermarket here in the yes. UK. <laughs> yeah. You no. don't have it in Malaysia, right? No, we don't have that in Malaysia. So I could walk down the road from here and I could have bought that for lunch, but it's ended up where you are in Malaysia. Yes. And I suppose someone who threw that away in the UK might think that they're doing a good thing, think that it's going to be recycled, it's going to save the planet. But in fact, it's been burnt on a roadside in Malaysia. Yes. I think it need a moment, frankly. Again, we're not saying recycling's a bad idea. It's just rarely done well. Shipping waste to the other side of the world uses emissions that recycling is meant to save. Yeah, and burning plastic that can't be recycled? That potentially has health consequences for the people who live nearby. People who didn't buy the sandwiches or the cosmetics in the first place. There's another consequence of recycling that may surprise even those who follow this issue closely. Jenny van Dorn is a professor in services marketing at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. I know that for many people, marketing is the root of all evil, right? That uh, we convince people <laughs> to buy stuff that they don't need. But I figured already more than a decade ago that if marketing is so powerful, then maybe we can also use what we know for marketing to make people make better decisions. Better decisions, specifically around recycling. A few years ago, Yeni noticed companies were beginning to boast about their recycling cred. For instance, you have jackets that have been made from old bottles. Even my mom was at a certain point uh, carrying something around that said, I used to be a bottle. I've seen that. Products advertised as being made from other things. Benches with signs like, I'm made of recycled plastic. Yeah, I even saw McDonald's talking about it on TV the other night. Millions of old McCafe cups become greetings cards. And those Happy Meal toys? Still making kids smile, now they've become playgrounds. Yenny wondered what effect these messages were having on people's behaviour. So she did an experiment. She offered a load of students plates of cookies to eat during a movie. So uh, we had many students wanting to participate. We gave them a lot, right? Even more than the average student can eat. <laughs> the students had a choice about what to do with their leftovers. They could put them out for other students to enjoy or throw them away. So for some participants, it was a black bin for general waste. For some participants, a green bin for biodegradable waste. And for some, they had a green bin and there we said, the biodegradable waste will be turned into biofuel to power the local buses in a new waste recycling project. And there we saw that people were 
nearly twice as likely to discard the food when they were told that it would be used to uh, power the local bus as biofuel. Wow. And yeah, that was rather uh, shocking, to be honest. <laughs> we expected some effect, but not that much. So for some, feeding a bus was more enticing than feeding people. Yeah, so they repeated the experiment, this time asking participants about their decision. And there we found that people who had the opportunity to throw their trash into the fancy new biofuel recycling scheme, they felt better about themselves than those who had imagined saving the food for others to actually eat. So it really made them feel good about themselves. This is powerful stuff. Most of us just want to feel good at the end of the day. And if we get the opportunity, we're going to take it. It seems some people get more of a warm, fuzzy glow from putting things in the recycling than reusing things. Which is basically what sharing the cookies with people would have been. Yeah. Yeni's team even tried the experiment with people choosing between glass drinking cups that could be washed and used again and single-use plastic cups, which they told people could be recycled into clothing. We also found that if people thought that their plastic bottle would be recycled, they would be more likely to choose the plastic bottle over the glass. Which is amazing, right? This suggests that well-advertised recycling schemes could actually encourage people to consume more and throw away more. Oops. Far from reducing emissions and helping to fight climate change, that's likely to increase them. Maybe this also explains why of the three R's we heard about earlier... Reduce. Reuse. Recycle. We seem to have forgotten about the first two. Reduce. Reuse. They don't make us feel as good. And no one gets rich. Our economy model today indeed is based on making more stuff, consuming more stuff. And we don't really have a successful alternative in mind. So it is indeed very, very tricky. Ke Wang from the World Resources Institute is having a go at making a difference anyway. She's trying to develop an idea called the circular economy. The circular economy is also more than recycling. It's about keeping products in use for longer. So keep that bottle used, not just use it for once, but use it many times. Simple to say, hard to do. I have two boys, and as any parent of young boys, you know, you, you probably go through a pair of jeans every six weeks or so when they start having holes on, on the knees. And I live in the Netherlands, right? So in the village I live, it is really more expensive just trying to get a patch on the knees than buying a new pair, right? So I still go to the repair shop, but why would average people do that when it's cheaper to just buy something new and throw away the old product? Now, if you live somewhere where there's a tailor on every block, you may find that a bit jaw-dropping. I once travelled to Liberia with a colleague from London who took clothes that needed mending because it was so much easier to find someone to do it there than in Europe. <laughs> and I remember talking to a friend of the programme, Rajesh Joshi, in India, and I was complaining to him about the trouble I was having fixing my headphones, and he just said, come to Delhi. There's a shop on every corner that could help you out. The economy is pretty much built on people selling more yeah. products, mm -hmm. so how do you encourage them to sell and produce less? So if we start thinking about products as services, then that may offer a way for companies to sort of decouple themselves from having to sell as many stuff as possible. This is a totally different way of thinking, but it's not just a wild idea. Kurt has a real world example. Schiphol Airport, Amsterdam. A major operation. In pre-pandemic times, it saw more than 70 million passengers a year. And uh, the airport requires a lot of lighting, right? Philips had been supplying the airport with light bulbs. Then someone had a bright idea. Why sell light bulbs when you could have a contract to supply light itself? Instead of selling this so many lamps, LEDs, they really sell light as a service and they get charged by how much light the airport gets. They look into how natural light can be used, so they will need less artificial light. Not having to sell new bulbs all the time to make money, the company instead designed fixtures that would last almost twice as long and that would be easier to swap out when they do fail. Profit for them and better for the climate. That's a market solution, but governments can help bend the economy into a more rounded shape too. You might even have experienced this for yourself. 
Countries from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe have banned plastic bags. Many other places have started charging shoppers to take one home. Yeni van Doren says these small tweaks in policy can make a big difference to how linear our economy is. So you change the default. When I went into a store and I bought a piece of clothing, even when it was like a small item, you got it handed over in a plastic bag. And that default changes now. There really is another decision that needs to be made. Like, yes, I want the plastic bag and yes, I want to pay for it. I don't know about you, but I have one of these reusable bags in my purse all the time. Plastic bag bans are typically introduced because of concerns about litter, not the climate. But if we demand fewer bags, fewer factories make them, which means we need less fossil fuel to keep the factories powered. It all has an impact on emissions. It's not the kind of thing, though, that's easily copied to other plastic products. Governments are wary of eroding consumer choice. After all, Costa Velis reminds us, plastic packaging exists for a reason. Plastics have delivered a lot of savings in terms of carbon emissions as a lighter packaging material in comparison to alternatives. So it, it has been highlighted as a more climate-friendly material in many respects. And that's why it has been replacing other materials like metals. Keeping food fresh for longer, saving weight, it seems likely that some recycling will always be necessary. However... It is a fact that we cannot just recycle our way out of the climate crisis. Let's go back to where we started. Not that. The poll that found that most people think recycling is the biggest thing they can do to help fight climate change. In some ways, it's such good news that people have grabbed onto something, which in most cases will make a difference, will involve fewer emissions. But it's possible that messaging has worked too well. It shouldn't really be a surprise that a green bin isn't an easy answer that will fix everything. Yeah, if we really want to fight climate change, we have bigger decisions, tougher choices to make in our everyday lives. Buying less. Flying less. Changing the way we get to work and school. And where recycling is necessary, we need to do it right. Thanks to producer Dervil Starr, series producer Alex Lewis, editor Richard Fenton-Smith, and the man who makes the mix, Tom Brignall. Until next time.